Okay, everyone, so let us uh, continue where we left off this morning. Yeah. Uh, we just had a look at the uh, Dveta Vitaka Sutta, uh, which uh, focuses on the idea of using wisdom to overcome defilements, uh, uh, which is kind of contrary to how we normally live our life, I think. I think most people, when they feel some kind of negative state coming up, the natural thing is just to suppress it, and kind of push it out of the way. Uh. So the uh, Buddhism kind of go against the stream once again, uh, and we try to kind of do something more thorough, and more thorough would be to eliminate it by wisdom rather than just holding it in check uh, and having it come out again at any any one time. Uh. Now the next sutta is called, uh, uh, what is it called again? Uh, How to Stop Thinking, uh, Vitaka Santana Sutta, or if you like, Calming the Thinking. Uh. And uh, it's a very nice sutta, and uh, I would, would have liked to go through it, but uh, we are kind of running a bit out of time now. So I thought of going straight to the last sutta. And then you can maybe, if you wish, you can read that sutta yourself. And maybe next time I'm back in Europe or the UK, we can do that sutta. Then you have an incentive to come back on the retreat, right? <laughs> We've got to create some incentives here. So that is the, my evil plan for you. Now. <laughs> so let's go to the very last one instead there. Uh, and this is called the Corruption. This is the uh, Upankilesa Sutta. And uh, it has some very nice Dhamma in it. And I chose this particularly because uh, I haven't used, done it on retreats in the past. Uh, so this is kind of quite different from what I have normally taught. But it's uh, about uh, deep meditation practice. Uh, and it has a few verses in it that I found in many places in the Pali Canon. Uh, very inspiring verses uh, found in places like the Dhammapada also in the Vinaya Pitaka, and also right here in the Majjhimanika. So very kind of core verses found in so many different places. And uh, this particular sutta is about something called the incident at Kosambi. Kosambi, one of the great cities of ancient India, and one of the so-called six great cities. And they weren't that great, actually, even though they're called great cities, but they were, <laughs> they were large, I guess, by the standards of the time. And this incident is an argument within the monastic Sangha, where the monks are arguing with each other, and the whole Sangha is uh, almost splitting apart. Well, it is splitting, uh, although it's not formally split yet. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, uh, kind of interesting to see how the Buddha deals with that. What does the Buddha do when the Sangha is splitting? Uh, and uh, it's kind of uh, fascinating. And I'll talk a, more, a bit more about these details uh, as we go through this uh, so uh, we're looking at this today, and maybe I'll look a little bit more at this uh, tomorrow morning as well. We'll see what happens tomorrow morning here. Yeah. So this is found in the middle length sayings number 128, Majjhima Nikaya, Corruptions of Upa Kilesa. And uh, you may have heard the word Kilesa many times. Uh, kilesa is used very commonly in kind of Buddhist circles to mean defilements of the mind, yeah, the bad qualities of the mind. Uh, uh, and it's kind of interesting because the word kilesa is not found very often in the suttas. So in the suttas you find words like upa kilesa or sam kilesa instead. Uh, and they are basically the same word, uh, but they have a prefix added to it, which kind of changes the meaning a little bit. Uh. So upa kilesa means something like a refined defilement. Yeah? And this sutta is really about the fine defilements of the mind, the kind of last little things that block you from going into deep samadhi. That is really what this is about. Uh. And this is how this word is used in the suttas. Uh, and then you have the word sankilesa, which is effectively synonymous with kilesa. Uh, but there is like a tendency in Buddhism uh, that the vocabulary we use, use in Buddhist uh, circles is usually tends to be more commentarial in nature than actually canonical. Uh, which is interesting because it shows us where, you know, what people are reading. It shows us what people, where we're getting our information from. Uh, and so it's good to be a little bit aware of that, uh, so you can kind of take countermeasures if you feel that something may not actually be the word of the Buddha, but maybe it's the word of some later commentator or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, upakilesa means refine the defilements of the mind. Yeah? It comes towards the very end, before you enter samadhi. Uh, before that, uh, we, uh, before you get to these upakilesas, yeah, you have the ordinary, uh, the ordinary kind of... Uh, um, purification of the mind happening through sila, through conduct, uh, through sense restraint and all of that, uh, 
And this is the very last vestige of uh, defilements that you are eliminating here. So let's see how we get up to that point, because all of this beginning of the sutta is how we get there here. So this is how it goes. So I have heard, at one time the Buddha was staying near Kosambi in Gosita's monastery here. So Gosita's monastery, the Gosita is usually the donor of the monastery, here, like uh, another Pindika's monastery. Here. So this was the donor of that monastery, his name was Gosita, which means the, the one who speaks, or something like that, or the spoken one, or something here. Slightly curious name, but anyway. Here. Now at that time, the mendicants of Kosambi were arguing, quarreling, and disputing here, continuing, continually wounding each other with barbed words. This word barbed words is, um, is um, mukka satehi in Pali, which literally means the swords of the mouth. That's quite evocative, isn't it? Using the swords of the mouth, words can be incredibly painful if they are kind of placed with kind of cunning and, uh, and uh, kind of bad intentions. Uh, barbed words. Uh. When the mendicant went up to the Buddha, bowed, stood to one side, and told him what was happening, adding, uh, Please, sir, uh, go to those mendicants out of compassion. Uh, and the Buddha consented in silence. Uh. Again, this idea of please do something out of compassion, which you see throughout the suttas. Uh, if you want to ask someone who you, uh, in the kind of Dhamma way, to help out, uh, always ask, please do it out of compassion, uh, because then you're showing a kind of higher understanding of what is going on. Uh. Then the Buddha went up to those mendicants and said, enough mendicants, uh, stop arguing, quarreling, and disputing. Uh. Right? Enough mendicants, stop doing this. So, what would you do if the Buddha came to you and said, Oh, you know, enough, would, would you say, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, I like arguing. Is that what you would say? Or would you say, Oh, yes, the Buddha, okay, sure, we will stop arguing? What, what would that feel like? And this is kind of an interesting point, right? Because uh, what this gives us, it gives us a feeling of the relationship that these people had with the Buddha. And in the modern world, especially if you ask a traditional Buddhist, uh, yeah, someone who has grown up in a traditional Buddhist culture, uh, and you ask them if the Buddha came, uh, it's like the Buddha, wow, the Buddha is kind of beyond, you know, beyond ordinary cognition. It's kind of something so awesome and amazing uh, that if the Buddha stopped to argue, he wouldn't think twice about arguing anymore. It would be completely impossible. Uh. But I think even people who have, uh, have not grown up in a kind of Buddhist culture, uh, the idea of the Buddha saying something really had impact. Still, we have a very extremely high idea of the Buddha in many ways. Uh. But uh, this gives us an idea of what these people, what kind of relationship they had with the Buddha. Uh. And this is kind of interesting, uh, because it says something about the Buddha, which is very opens our ways of seeing the Buddha in a new way. And this is, uh, I find this very interesting. Uh. So when the Buddha had said this, uh, one of the men, they can said to the Buddha, Wait, sir, let the Buddha, the Lord of the Dhamma, remain passive, dwelling in blissful meditation in the present life. We will be known for this arguing, quarreling, and disputing here. <clears throat> it's a, that's pretty disrespectful, isn't it, uh, when you say this kind of thing? I mean, it's kind of said with so-called nice words, but it's not really nice at all. Uh, and uh, this is kind of very fascinating, because it shows you that for them, the Buddha was more like one of them. Yeah? He was not a god, he was not some kind of outlandish figure at all. Eh? He was a human being who you related to. Yes, you respected him, you said it nicely, but it was okay to kind of disregard what he said, right? And carry on as before. Eh? That's what it looks like here. Eh? And that is... Um, it's, again, it kind of shows us the humanity of the Buddha. He was regarded as a human being. Yeah? Uh, uh, by the people who were around him. He was not put uh, on a pedestal, on the, certainly not on the wrong kind of pedestal, maybe on the pedestal, not the wrong one. Uh, and uh, this is uh, kind of comes out very powerfully. Uh, and this is useful for us to remember, uh, because when we remember this, we can also have a relationship with the Buddha, not where we dismiss him in this way, uh, but where we take him as a, another teacher, a human being, uh, we can relate much more directly to than maybe we ordinarily think. Yeah. So it's interesting, it's also interesting to see how disrespectful they actually were. 
and uh, how human nature hasn't changed in two and a half thousand years. Uh, things are the same now as they were then. Uh, so, what happens now? What do you think the Buddha does? Uh, okay, let's see. <laughs> For the second time, uh, and the third time, the Buddha said to those mendicants, uh, enough mendicants, uh, stop arguing, quarreling, and disputing. Uh, everything is three times in the suttas. So you give people three chances, if you don't get it by then, okay, that's, that's it. Uh, for a third time, that mendicant said to the Buddha, wait, sir, let the Buddha, the lord of the Dhamma, remain passive, uh, dwelling in blissful meditation in the present life. Uh, we will be known for this arguing, quarreling, and disputing here. Yeah. Now, so what do you do when no one listens to you? Yeah, the, the Buddha kind of, kind of, okay, no one is going to listen. What do you do? And, uh, well, let's see what happens, because this is com comes up very soon. And it's kind of, once you see it, it's kind of obvious, I suppose. Then the Buddha robed up in the morning and taking his bowl and robe entered Kosambi for alms. Yeah, so this is uh, the usual way of collecting alms food uh, for the mendicants. You enter the village for alms. Uh, this still happens in many countries around in Asia. Uh, you walk into the village. Uh, it's a very beautiful thing when that happens. Uh, very kind of uh, touching. I've done that myself many times when visiting Asia. In the West, it's a bit more difficult to do because you go to the local village and people just look at you as if we're wondering, what on earth are you doing here? <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm being a bit unfair here to the Western, because actually some people in the West, they do ask you, yeah, what are you, what are you doing here? And, you know, can I, can I offer you some money here? Because I think that's what goes in the bowl, is money here. No, actually, no, no money in the bowl, we, but some food would be great. And then they ask some people, and this is actually very nice again, they ask you, and then they haven't got any food, and so they go to the local shop, buy food for you, come back and put it in a bowl. It doesn't happen to me a few times there. That's kind of really sweet, isn't it? They are not Buddhists, they have no idea about Buddhism. They just do it because they, I don't know, maybe there's something about the monastic that people respect or something, I'm not sure. But it's very touching and very nice when that happens. So, but of course the point here is that the Buddha also acts like an ordinary monk. Yeah? He goes into the village and collects arms like anyone else. And so the villagers you know, get to put food in the Buddha's bowl, this kind of... Astonishing, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, and then uh, he goes on this ordinary arms round. Uh, uh, then after the meal, on the return from arms round, he sets his lodging in order. Uh, this is a sign that he is about to depart. Uh, yeah, what do you do when no one listens to you? You leave. Yeah, that usually is quite powerful, right? If you are the Buddha, you are kind of this power, and you kind of just go, people start thinking, wait a minute, maybe we have done a mistake. Usually that's kind of how psychology works. Uh, Taking his bowl and robe, he recited these verses while st standing right there. So just as he's about to leave, he uh, recites these verses. And these are very, very famous verses uh, that you find in the Dhammapada, in the Vinaya Pitaka, and then right here. And they go as follows. I'll read through them first of all and come back and comment on them. Uh, when many voices shout at once, uh, no one thinks that they're a fool. Uh, while the Sangha is being split, uh, Non thought another to be better. Dolts pretending to be astute, they talk their words right out of bounds, they blab at will, their mouths agape, and no one knows what leads them on. They abuse me, they hit me, they beat me, they rob me. For those who bear such a grudge, hatred never ends. They abuse me, they hit me, they beat me, they rob me. For those who bear no such grudge, hatred has an end. For hatred is never settled by hate, it's only settled by love. This is an eternal truth. Others don't understand that here we need to be restrained. But those who do understand this, being clever, settle their conflicts. Breaker of bones and takers of life, thieves of cattle, horses and wealth, those who plunder the nation, even they can come together. So why on earth can't you? If you find an alert companion, a wise and virtuous friend, then overcoming all adversities, wander with them, joyful and mindful. If you find no alert companion, no wise and virtuous friend, then like a king who flees his conquered realm, wander alone like a tusker in the wilds. 
It is better to wander alone. There is no fellowship with fools. Wander alone and do no wrong. At ease like a tusker in the wilds. So you, the Buddha is about to leave. He's going to wander alone like a tusker in the wilds. So let's go back to the uh, beginning again. Uh, and uh, so you, we have this, this starting point here with many voices uh, shouting at once and no one thinks that they're a fool. Uh, yeah, and this is kind of a very common thing you see in the world when you, come in, when you get into a group. You get group psychology takes over uh, and you forget about what actually is right and wrong and you're drawn along with the group. Uh, it's very difficult to be a kind of very solid, have a very solid individual uh, stand or take on things when the group is going in one way. There's a tendency for us to want to follow the group, uh, yeah, especially when the groups become very powerful. Uh, like when you kind of walk in a demonstration uh, or something like that and everyone starts to do things that are a bit stupid, uh, you tend to follow along. Uh, you also shout obscenities. Uh, you also might become a little bit violent because the group is becoming violent. It's a danger of, of group psychology. Uh, so uh, there's a tendency to... This group thing is very dangerous. Uh, so one of the important things we need to do as uh, Buddhists is to stand our ground uh, and to ask ourselves always what is right, what is wrong. Uh, and forget about the group. Uh, the group is irrelevant. Uh, the group is often wrong. We know that from history, groups are often wrong. Majority is usually wrong. Uh, there's the minority who will sometimes see the alternative way, yeah? the Einsteins of the world, the Newtons of the world, uh, these kind of people who see the alternative, uh, and the Buddhas of the world. Uh. So we need to be unafraid and take a stance according to truth, uh, and not allow the group to lead the way. Uh. Same thing when we uh, do Dharma practice, when we uh, contemplate who is worthy of respect and all of these kind of things. Uh, we should not be afraid, uh, we should be humble, but we should also not be afraid of going against the stream of things. Uh. Otherwise we're going to end up being stupid. You don't think you're a fool, even though actually you are a fool. Uh. Yeah, while the Sangha is being split, uh, none thought another to be better. You, even though the Sangha, even though the, one of the worst things that can happen according to Buddhism, Sangha Beda, schism in the Sangha is kind of happening, still no one really thinks, you know, maybe there's another way or alternative reality here. Yeah. Dolts pretending to be a student, they talk the words right out of bounds. Uh, um, Okay, I can't remember the Pali here. Uh, anyway, they blam at will, their mouths agape. No one knows what leads them on. Yeah, when you are driven by the crowd or driven by something, you, don't really, you can't really see what is driving you anymore. You have lost contact with your inner motives and desires. Uh, and you're driven on by this kind of external urging. Uh, and uh, you start saying things that are crazy. Your words are out of bounds. Uh, you think you are smart, but actually you are foolish uh, and you have no idea what's going on. Uh. You can see how these things happen with people. Uh. And then we come to these very famous verses uh, that, uh, uh, again, are recited, uh, you know, you can hear all, always around the Buddhist world, in the Dhammapada specifically. Uh. They abused me, they hit me, they beat me, they robbed me. Uh. For those who bear such a grudge, hatred never ends. Uh. They abused me, they hit me, they beat me, they robbed me. For those who bear no such grudge, uh, hatred has an end. And so the idea with these verses is that abuse, uh, even being hit, uh, being robbed, uh, these are non-negotiables in our world. Uh, you, someone is going to abuse you. Sometimes people will rob you. Uh, people might even hit you, uh, right? Uh, and uh, so these are part and parcel of life. These are givens. These are not things that you can choose or not choose. Uh, Certainly the first one to be abused occasionally, that's kind of that's how, how things are. And robbed, I guess most people also have had some minor robbery at least occasionally. And so um, uh, because of that, because these are non-negotiables, uh, we have to accept that the world is like this. Uh, you're never going to have a world, world, world that is perfect, uh, a world where you know, these things are not going to happen. It's just not gonna, there is no such world. Uh, and for that reason, the only choice we really have is how we're going to react to these things. Uh, you can react with anger, with ill will. They shouldn't rob me. Yeah? They shouldn't abuse me. Yeah? Or we can come to the conclusion that this is the way the world is. There's no point in getting angry about it. Uh, we're not going to solve this anyway. Yeah? So you cool down uh, and you react in a different way, understanding this is the reality. Yeah? 
And then you think about it clearly, and then maybe you can take some kind of evasive action or do something to avoid it a little bit more. Yeah, it's never going to be gone completely, you know? but at least, at least you can take some rational action about these things. So. so this is one of those things, yeah, understanding what we can do something about and what we can't, uh, and then do where we actually have an agency, yeah, where we can change the kind of how society works or how we work. Yeah. So when people do bad things to you, uh, never get angry, yeah. Yeah? Remember, it is not really your problem when something, somebody does something bad towards you. It always feels personal when people do bad things towards us, but actually it's never personal. It is the conditioning of the other person that comes out at that particular time. It emerged at that time, the conditioning, deep from the deep past somewhere. And you happen to be in the presence, and because you happen to be in the presence, you have to bear with those things that come out of that person. If it's abuse, it's, if it's violence or whatever it is. And so instead of getting angry with the other person, you realize actually the problem is theirs. It's got nothing to do with you really, even though it feels personal. And the moment you realize it is not personal, you change from having this sense of me, my world. I have to protect me from these larger forces outside. A kind of self-centered view of the world. You change from that to having compassion for the other person, because the other person is the one who has the problem, not you. And so you move from a self-centered view of the world, uh, about me, uh, to this broad view of the world, your kind of mind widens out, right? Uh, and you have a sense of compassion for everyone instead. Uh, and when that happens, it's actually a very powerful and very beautiful thing to happen in your life. Uh, because that world of me and the scaredness for the world outside is small, it is narrow, it is scary because the world looks like it is opposing you and you are kind of always open, you're always vulnerable and the world is always ready to attack you. But then when you have compassion, you don't feel that anymore. You lose that sense of boundary between you and the world outside, it completely dissolves and your mind kind of becomes broad and large and you encompass the world. The fear is gone, the anxiety is gone. And actually the opposite happens instead, compassion, love, friendliness for the world around. So it is it's kind of this, the difference between getting angry and having compassion is just a tiny change in perception. How do we look at people in the world around us? Do we see them as victims of their own conditioning, of their own past, of all of these things? Or do we see them as perpetrators of some kind of terrible crime? And uh, that difference is all it takes uh, to have compassion for people, to have forgiveness, to be able to let go. Uh, when someone is abusing you, you look at them, you think, yeah. <laughs> you don't say this, you just think this, yeah. You have a, you are the one, you have a, you know, I wish I can help you. You have a, you obviously have some kind of, uh, some problem here, uh, there's something going on here. Uh, yeah, you, of course you can't say that to someone because they're going to get even more angry, but you, you kind of just, uh, yeah, you think this and you feel this. Actually, I would really like to help you now. Uh, because you, you, are, you, you really do have a delusion or some issue going on. Uh, and, uh, and when you react like that, when someone is angry at you, uh, it very often it diffuses the situation. Uh, how can you get angry with someone who has compassion back, uh, even if it's just in their eyes, uh, just in their expression? Uh, very hard to sustain the anger. Anger usually feeds on more anger. One person, you get angry back, and then you justify your own anger in the first place, because the other person obviously reacts in a bad way. Uh, and then it kind of diffuses the whole thing. Yeah. So this is really how to deal with the problems of the world, the times when we feel that we are being uh, treated unfairly and badly by others, uh, yeah, is to depersonalize it uh, and to see it as this conditions, phenomena. People are just phenomena in a certain way, conditioned in a certain way, and they hurt you when, because of that conditioning. Uh, not because they really want to. I think most people in the world want to be kind. Uh, yeah, why? Because I think deep down we know that kindness is equivalent to happiness. When you're kind to someone else, you feel good, they feel good, everyone benefits from that. And I think almost everyone knows that deep down. But if I ask you to be kind at all times, you can't do it, right? It's impossible to almost never get angry. Occasionally you get at least a bit irritated, right? It's superhuman not to get irritated ever. But maybe there are some superhumans around, that would be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and I think there still are in this world some superhumans in this way. Yeah. But uh, it is very hard because the conditioning is so powerful. Yeah. Even if you tell yourself, I will never get angry, you will still get angry. Yeah. You can't just, just can't do it. Yeah. 
And then when we realize all this conditioning again, the compassion comes out. Uh, it's not that hard to do. Uh, yeah? All it does, it takes a reconditioning of the mind. Uh, everyone here can do it without any problem if you put your mind to it. Uh, so uh, this is really, really worthwhile because this is where the path actually comes together quite powerfully. You're overcoming some of the worst uh, qualities in human beings. Uh, for never is hatred settled by hate, it is only settled by love. This is an eternal truth. One of the very, very famous verses in the Dhammapada. Um, yeah, the hate always begets more hate. Hate produces more hate in the other person. And it's interesting when you look at the world how often people carry the injustices of the past with them. They want to have revenge. Yeah. And sometimes you hear these stories about people who are kind of remember things that happened hundreds of thousands of years ago, then passed it down from one generation to the next. Don't forget, yeah, your ancestor twenty generations back, yeah, they were kind of they were these invaders came and they kind of killed your great 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 <laughs> whatever grandmother or father or whatever. <laughs> that's really nuts, isn't it? But that's kind of how we how we uh, perpetuate hate in our society, pass it on from one generation to the next one. Uh, sometimes we are really amazingly foolish in that way. Yeah. So the only way to, do, to overcome hate is to be kind back and to understand that actually it's not your problem at all. If someone else is hateful, it's got nothing to do with you, only to do with them. Then you can have love, you can have compassion, uh, and often it settles down the problem. Uh, Okay, others don't understand that here we need to be restrained, but those who do understand this, being clever, settle their conflicts. And obviously he's here kind of referring back to the monks, yeah, you should really understand that you need to restrain yourself here. Yeah, instead of arguing with each other, you should hold back. Sometimes restraint is a very good thing, just looking on without getting involved. Yeah, that can be very powerful sometimes. And then you can see the Buddha here, kind of uh, is despairingly at, at his monks, yeah, the breakers of bones and takers of life and thieves of cattle, horses and wells, those who plunder the nation, even they can come together. So why on earth can't you? <laughs> if you find an alert companion, a wise and virtuous friend, then overcome all adversities, uh, wonder with them, joyful and mindful. Uh, so here is the idea of the uh, Kalyana Mitta. You find an alert here, means like a wise companion, a uh, yeah, virtuous friend. Uh, and uh, it, uh, a wise companion can always be very helpful. Uh, yeah? So you bring them along, they help to remind you of the Dhamma, you remind them of the Dhamma, and you kind of build each other up, uh, practicing in the right way. Uh. Um, but if there is no wise companion, uh, or alert companion, no wise or virtuous friend, uh, and like a king who flees his conquered realm, uh, wander alone like a tusker uh, in the wilds. Uh. Yeah, so uh, if there isn't any wise companion, uh, you have to kind of set out on your own, uh, right? Uh, you, uh, um, uh, you uh, have this beautiful simile here, the king who flees his conquered realm. Yeah, when, the, when your realm is conquered, you have no choice, you just have to go. That's what the king does, he leaves. Uh, and in the same way, it's like your, your realm or the world has been conquered by someone who is foolish. Uh, and so you leave, you depart, and you go into the wilds like a tusker. Uh, a tusker here usually means a large elephant with enormous tusks, right? And they are known for actually being solitary sometimes. Uh, they go in the jungle on their own. Uh, and you do the same thing. Yeah. Why? Because uh, fools bring you down. Uh, yeah, when we know how conditioned we are, it matters enormously who we are with. Uh, because they will either brainwash you in a bad way or in a good way. So the so-called Papa Mitta, the bad friend, uh, they will actually have a detrimental effect on you, big time. Uh, we forget uh, that con how important conditioning is. Uh, uh, and that, when we forget that, uh, disaster happens. Uh, and this is kind of the, uh, the problem here. Uh. So you remember the importance of conditioning, yeah? and then you hang out with those people that actually support you in conditioning you in the right way. The importance of Kalyana Mitta, good friendship. Uh. And this is a very important thing to remember in life. Yeah? Who do you take to be your friends? Who do you hang out with the most? Uh, 
And uh, there's always a, a uh, danger there if you hang out with the wrong kind of people that they will have a wrong kind of effect on you. Uh, of course, wrong people here means often really wrong. Yeah, people who really drag you out in the wrong way, make you break the precepts and act badly. Yeah, that, of course, it is what is really bad here. People who are more neutral, yeah, it's not obvious, not such a big deal. Yeah, but ideally, you have someone who thinks like you or even more high-minded than you are, who kind of can uh, drag you along in the right direction. Yeah. It is better to wander alone. There is no fellowship with fools. Uh, Wander alone and do no wrong, at ease, like the tusker in the wilds. And so this is why the Buddha is about to set out, and he basically saying here that his fellow monks who are arguing, they are fools, that was essentially his saying here. And so he kind of says, goodbye, good luck, and now I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what's kind of happening here. So then... Uh, it, can, it goes on, after speaking these verses, uh, actually I should uh, maybe tell you a little bit about what this argument was about, right? Because this is kind of interesting as well, and it says something about human nature, uh, because you might think that if this Sangha is being split, uh, then it must be some very important argument, right? Who is an Arahant, maybe? Actually, you, you, know, you wouldn't really argue about that, it would be pretty embarrassing, but... Uh, uh, or some big deal, maybe someone is committing some very serious offense or something, yeah? But no, human nature being human nature, arguments are usually about very petty things. And the argument in this case, there was a, a, a I think a toilet, yeah? And uh, this ancient the Indian toilets, they have, you have water in the toilet for cleaning yourself. And then after you have kind of used the water, you're supposed to empty out the pitcher, the pitcher in which the water is kept, right? And if you don't empty out the water, it's considered to be a very minor offense. That was what the argument was about, yeah? Someone had forgotten to empty out the water, and some were saying, you have committed an offense, others were saying, no, I have not committed an offense. And this led to almost a split in the Sangha. <laughs> it's very typical, isn't it, for human beings? Sometimes we, it's almost like these things build up and build up, and the last straw is the pitcher of water, right? That is, wow! And you, the obviously, there must have been some underlying tensions there already yeah, for these things to happen here. Yeah. So, uh, it's useful to remember this. It's useful to kind of, if there is tensions and things going on, uh, it's always useful to forgive uh, and uh, as we move along. So we don't build up these tensions. Uh, we don't pretend that things are okay, but in fact they are not, uh, until it reaches a breaking point and the kind of things go completely haywire, uh, because you have kind of, I have had enough! <laughs> and see how these things happen. Uh, and uh, so building up, building up to the, uh, that kind of wrecking point. Uh. So uh, that is what the argument was about, uh, and the Buddha was not very impressed, and so he departs, and uh, this is what happens next. Uh, after speaking these verses while standing, uh, the Buddha went to the village of uh, Balakalonika. He has translated it as the village of the child salt miners. I think, uh, I think a name should better not be translated because it just sounds weird when you translate a name. So anyway, uh, I, th I prefer Balakalonika, uh, where Venerable Bhagu was staying at the at the time. Bhagu saw the Buddha coming off in the distance, uh, so he spread out the seat and placed water for washing the feet. The Buddha sat on the seat, spread out, and washed his feet. Bhagu bowed to the Buddha and sat down to one side. Yeah, this is a kind of a usual way that things happen. You prepare a seat when someone is coming, you put out water for washing the feet, and you will notice here that the Buddha washes his own feet, which is these days sometimes monks get their feet washed by others, so the Buddha was more humble than some of the modern monks. So he sits down, the Bhagu bows to the Buddha, a yeah, standard uh, kind of procedure in those days. Uh, and then the Buddha said to him, I hope you are keeping well, mendicant. I hope you are all right. I hope you are having no trouble getting alms food. You will notice how the Buddha calls him mendicant. Yeah? The Buddha probably doesn't know his name. So many disciples, how can he possibly kind of keep control of all those disciples? Maybe I should, I should just as I'm wrong, just call him monks, monk, monk, I hope you're okay here. And he doesn't have to kind of 
worry about the names. I, I remember many years ago, Arjun Brown went on this six-month retreat, right? And he said that while he was on this six-month retreat, he had kind of given up the monastery completely, relinquished the monastery. Huh? And one day he saw one of the monks that he ordained, completely forgotten about his name. Uh, that time is good to have the word monk, yeah? Monk, I hope you are okay here. Yeah. <laughs> Makes it, can, it looks kind of better than saying, oh, what's your name again? Oh. <laughs> so, that, yeah, that's a, that's a really good idea. But, okay, anyway, sometimes you get this good idea just by reading the sutta. So, thank you for listening. Yeah. So, um, and then it's, it's this kind of nice conversation that they have. And this is kind of also, again, I mentioned before, very common, especially in the Vinya Pitika. I hope you're keeping well. Hope you are all right. Hope, we, hope you're having no trouble getting alms food. Yeah, the kind of important things in life. Uh. And then he says, I'm keeping well, sir. I'm all right. I'm having no trouble getting alms food. Uh. Then the Buddha educated, encouraged, and fired up and inspired Bhagu with the Dhamma talk. Yeah. After which he got up from his seat and set out for the eastern bamboo park. So this is uh, typical. Uh, yeah, the Buddha kind of fires you up and inspires you with the Dhamma talk. This happens throughout the suttas using exactly those words. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is kind of the Buddha's mission, is to teach the Dhamma. That's really all he does. Uh, and he here he takes this one single monk. Imagine how... Lucky this monk felt, where the Buddha just appears out of the blue, comes into his monastery and gives him a personal Dhamma talk. Yeah. Isn't that kind of neat? That's really cool, isn't it? Uh, those were the days. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit, it feels a bit like that. Suddenly the Buddha just appears. Yeah? And it's kind of random, just because these monks were quarreling in Kosambi, he comes, go, comes your way. Yeah? And uh, what we forget sometimes uh, is that we actually have access to all of those Dhamma talks all the time. Uh, we have access to far more Dhamma talks on the Buddha than probably the monks and the nuns and the lay people had at that time. We have all the suttas. True, the Buddha is not there personally delivering to us, but in a sense, as I mentioned yesterday, he is. And it's up to us to make these real teachings, teachings where we actually feel the presence of the Buddha. And when we do that, we can be a little bit lit like Bhagu. We can go back home, we can go to your little study or your little, you know, wherever you sit and read your suttas, your armchair, and you can kind of, or sit, sit on the floor maybe, yeah, on a mat, so you feel a bit more like you are, like a monastic or a lay person listening to the Buddha. And you can read the suttas, and you can recreate this idea in your mind uh, that the Buddha is talking to you. Uh. This makes these things very powerful. Uh. You become like a little Bhagu uh, sitting there, uh, yeah, listening to the suttas. Uh. Um, so he goes to the eastern bamboo park, Pubarama. Uh, um, anyway, yeah, can't remember the Pali name, now doesn't matter. Now at that time, the Venerable Anuruddha Nandiya in Kimbala was staying in the eastern bamboo park. Yeah. The park keeper saw the Buddha coming off in the distance and said to the Buddha, Don't come into the park, ascetic. There are three gentlemen who love themselves staying here. Don't disturb them. <laughs> I'm not sure about this translation, if I'm going to be absolutely honest. I, I find this a little bit uh, weird. So, um, <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry, Bhattu Siddhartha, but here I have to depart uh, with you and then take a slightly different direction. So. Anyway, let's, let's start from the beginning here. So Anuruddha, Nandiya and Kimbala, they were kind of the three ideal monks in many ways. You meet them here, you meet them in a few other places. And they were very always living in harmony with each other. And they were kind of the, the example, it seems, that others should follow. And they were staying together. Yeah? And then they, they have a park keeper who is there, which is kind of nice. Someone at the gate, maybe. There probably is a, maybe a wall or a fence around this park. Yeah? And when he sees the Buddha, he says, don't come in. Yeah? And he is obviously protective of his monks. He obviously is very close to these monks. Yeah, he wants to kind of spare them other people coming in and being noisy or whatever. And um, uh, so then he says this to the Buddha. And what this actually means, the Pali word is attakama, and it means something like someone who has their own benefit at heart. Yeah, someone who is practicing for their own benefit. Atta is purpose or benefit. Kama is desiring. Someone who desires their own benefit or desires their own. Uh, so it's not entirely wrong what he says here, but it sounds a bit corny in my, to my ears. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, so they're practicing for their own benefit, and they're staying here. Uh, don't disturb them. Uh. 
right? It's kind of uh, nice of this park keeper to look after his monks. Uh, you become after a while, you become it becomes his monks, right? My these are my monks in this monastery. Don't do anything bad to my monks. And lots of lay people in the world are like this. They become very possessive of their monks. Yeah, this is my monk. Don't touch my monk. Stay away. Yeah. It's kind of <laughs> it's very. Very interesting, yeah. And that relationship between uh, monastics and lay people is sometimes quite fascinating in, in different ways. Uh, uh, don't disturb them. Huh? And then Anuruddha heard the park keeper conversing with the Buddha and said to him, Don't keep the Buddha out, good park keeper. Huh? Our teacher, the Blessed One, has arrived. Huh? Then Anuruddha went to Nandiya and Kimbala and said to them, Come forth, venerables, come forth. Our teacher, the Blessed One, has arrived. Huh? Then Anuruddha, Nandi and Kimbala came out to greet the Buddha. One received his bowl and robe, one spread out the seat, and one set out water for washing the feet. The Buddha sat on the seat, spread out, and washed his feet. Those venerables bowed and sat down to one side. The Buddha said to Anuruddha, I hope you are keeping well, Anuruddha and friends. I hope you are all right. I hope you're having no trouble getting alms food. We're keeping well, sir. We're all right, and we're having no trouble getting alms food. There's a small little thing there which is worthwhile pointing out. Do you notice the Anuruddha and friends? Which sounds a little bit strange, perhaps. And uh, this is this uh, 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 the way things were done at that time is that when you uh, are addressing someone, uh, you address the group through the most senior member. And because Anuruddha is the most senior person, you address them as Anuruddhas. As Anuruddha in the plural is what you find there. So I hope you are well, Anuruddhas, is quite literally what it says. And from that, you know that when the Buddha is talking to a crowd, he always addresses the most senior members in that crowd. So that's why bhikkhus means monks, nuns, and lay people. Yeah? If he says Sariputta, he means Sariputta, and all the other people around at that time. That's kind of very useful information. You get an idea of the idiom of the old Pali language, how it works, the peculiar peculiarities of this language. Um, then the Buddha says, and this is where it kind of gets interesting, I hope you are living in harmony, appreciating each other without quarreling, blending like milk and water, regarding each other with kindly eyes. And yeah, this is a kind of a beautiful sentiment, living in harmony, appreciating each other, yeah, without worrying, blending like milk and water. In other words, there's complete blending. It's not like water and oil, but it's like milk and water. Yeah, regarding each other with kindly eyes. Yeah. It's a very nice sentiment. Yeah. So let's see what he has to say. Yeah. Indeed, sir, we live in harmony, as you say. Yeah. But how do you live this way? Yeah? In this case, sir, I think I'm fortunate, so very fortunate, to live together with spiritual companions such as these. I consistently treat these venerables with kindness by way of body, speech and mind, both in public and in private. I think, why don't I set aside my own ideas and just go along with these venerables' ideas? And that's what I do. Though we are different in body, sir, it's as if we are one in mind. So this is how you live in harmony, right? And this is, you will find out very soon, is the very foundation for all success in meditation practice. Based on this, meditation takes off. But it's very, the way it is put is very kind of, I don't know, there's something very powerful about this to my mind. Yeah, The idea of thinking, I am fortunate, so very fortunate, to have spiritual companions such as these. It's a very powerful sentiment. It's like when you're sitting in here and you look at the people around you, you don't even look at them, you just feel their presence, you know that they're here. And you think, wow, how fortunate I am to have spiritual companions such as these. If you think like that, how can you not feel a sense of uplift? How can you not feel a sense of joy and happiness? How can not this... Anusat is the recollections we were talking about before of the Kalyanamitta. How cannot that take off? If you really feel this in a heartfelt way, wow, I'm so fortunate. It's so easy. So many people in the world don't have friends like this. This is just extraordinary luck on my part or a good karma. It doesn't matter what the reason is. I know this is incredibly fortunate. 
And of course, once you think like that, you become extraordinarily sensitive and kind and caring to these people. And you start looking after them in a kind of entirely new way because actually, wow, I'm so lucky. I need to look after this precious opportunity and all of these precious people so I can keep on living with people like this. That is kind of how you feel. And of course, that is the consequence that he then brings out, right? I'm so lucky. I consistently treat them with kindness by body, speech and mind. Of course you do, if you feel you're lucky. If you found a treasure, you want to keep the treasure. You don't want to throw it away. And this is like finding a treasure. Some of the greatest treasures in the world is precisely the Kalyana Midas. Finding the Buddha is basically finding the greatest treasure in the world. If you are so lucky that you have discovered the Buddha in your life, wow, how fortunate. And then you have all these other people as well who support you in a similar kind of way. So this is how you make the path work, right? This is the foundation for everything. Get this right, and meditation is going to be easy. Both in public and in private. You're not two-faced, you're one-faced. Yeah, you have the same face in private as you have in public. Yeah? You don't go back grumbling when you go back home, oh yeah, these Buddhists, they're all right, I suppose, or, or whatever. <laughs> you actually, no, you take back that good feeling back. Yeah? You have integrity about, your, about yourself. Yeah? And of course, the beautiful idea of setting aside my own ideas and go along with someone else's ideas. Yeah? And this is so important if harmony is going to prevail. Yeah? It's so easy to think that our ideas are important, and because they are so important, there's no way I'm going to give in to whatever anyone else does. And, but remember that it doesn't matter if your ideas, even if they are better, and maybe they are. Actually, harmony is more important than getting your ideas right. And one of these kind of nice sayings that I like is the saying that actually it is often more important how you implement something than what you choose. Yeah, whether you go this way or that way may not matter so much, but how you implement that, that is often what creates success in life. And if you think about it in that way, actually, maybe your idea is a great one or whatever, but because implementation is more important, harmony is what matters, because harmony is what is going to ensure that implementation happens in the right way. So this idea of setting things aside, and I see people who live in harmony, they're often the people who are a bit in the background. Yeah, they're not in the foreground, they're not kind of projecting their egos and saying, I am here, look at me. Those kind of people are the ones who create problems. And I have noticed how often the committee work is often very hard in the Buddhist world. And I think the, the people who like committees, are maybe, maybe they're the people who kind of, I don't know, I, mean, I shouldn't say this, because some... <laughs> Some committed people are actually really, really good people that do the right thing. But it's kind of, it would make sense that, uh, you know, some people would like to kind of be leaders and yeah, I will be the leader or whatever. Like, you know, they, they think that their ideas are important. That's why they want to take that position. So maybe that does create sometimes a bit of friction. I don't know. I, I really don't want to say anything bad about people who take on committee roles because actually it's a big sacrifice. And I really appreciate those people who do it. But when you, once you are in a committee, actually I think it's quite hard to do this kind of thing. You have to be really wise to let go of your own ideas and just uh, go with the majority or someone else actually. Yeah. But that is what is required, yeah? Okay, fine, let's go with what you think. It doesn't matter, yeah. I, can, uh, I can live with that or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we do. What, though we are one in body, it is as if we are one in mind, yeah? And then the Venerable Nandiya and Kimbala spoke likewise, and they added, that is how we live in harmony, appreciating each other without quarreling, blending like milk and water, and regarding each other with kindly eyes. Good, good, Anaruda and friends, I hope you are living diligent, yeah, or heedful, keen and diligent. Indeed, sir, we live heedfully. But how do you live in this way? So how do you live heedfully here? I, you, you might think this is going to be some kind of advanced practice, right? And actually, it turns out to be very simple. So let's see how you live heedfully here. In this case, sir, whoever returns first from arms round prepares the seats and puts out the drinking water and the rubbish bin. If there's anything left over, whoever returns at last eats it if they like. Otherwise, they throw it out where there's a little that grows or drop it into water uh, with few or no living creatures. Uh, then they put away the seeds, drinking water and rubbish bin, and sweep the refectory. Uh, 
If someone says the pot of uh, water for washing, drinking, or the toilet is empty, they set it out. If he can't do it by himself, he summons another with a wave of the hand, and they set it out by lifting it with their hands together. But we don't break into speech for that reason. And every five days we sit together for the whole night and discuss the teachings. That is how we live, um, heedful, keen, and diligent. <laughs> Kind of interesting, isn't it? It's very simple, very basic. But of course, the idea here is that, again, is that they live in harmony. They do these things and they don't even have to speak to each other. They kind of just wave with a hand, okay, come on, help me here, yeah? And they help each other. And of course, this is kind of the whole point here. Everyone does their duties and if something needs to be done, you do it. If someone else has forgotten, you don't say, yeah, that's your job, yeah, do this. No, you just do it. And uh, then uh, you don't talk to each other because talking is obviously uh, detrimental for meditation practice. Uh, so you avoid that, just like we're doing here on this retreat. Uh, and then every five days they sit together and have like a long Dhamma discussion together. Uh, so that's kind of really simple. Uh, that's how they are heedful. And of course, in the meantime, they do a lot of meditation practice. Uh, so, so, so kind of simple. Uh, and... Um, yeah, so what are the results of all of this? Uh, yeah, these very simple things. And it's always, one of the things that always kind of uh, strikes me again and again when I read the suttas, the word of the word, is how simple the path is. Uh, yeah, it is so easy to understand what you have to do. Uh, uh, the reason why it is hard practice is simply because our habits are so strong. Uh, the habits are going in the wrong direction, uh, and we need to overcome things that are very deeply ingrained in us. Uh, it's like we are railroaded in a certain direction. Uh, and uh, that is why it is hard, not because it is hard to understand. Uh, yeah, it is very simple to understand. Just be kind. Uh, actually, maybe I can do this. Uh, you don't need to understand dependent ri origination in forward and reverse order uh, yeah, to be able to practice this path. Uh. Good, good, uh, Anuruddha and friends. Uh, but as you are living diligent like this, uh, have you achieved any superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones? A meditation at ease. Now we get to the real business. Yeah, This is where things are. So based on what we have seen so far, have you achieved anything really profound? Superhuman distinction, a sort of superhuman quality, a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. What this refers to... Uh, superhuman quality, uh, Uttari Manusadhamma in the Pali language, refers to uh, four jhanas uh, and four stages of awakening. Uh, superhuman qualities. Uh, yeah? Superhuman is like beyond, beyond ordinary human beings. Super in that sense. Uh, not like Superman, or, or maybe it's the same thing, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe it should be Superman qualities. That would be cool translation. <laughs> No, I don't think that would work. Too many kind of cultural, dodgy cultural references. So, um, but um, superhuman qualities, right? Uh, so it refers to the four jhanas and the four stages of awakening. And that is kind of really, really interesting in its own right. Uh, I mean, obviously the stages of awakening are very interesting because this is where you leave the, all those samsaric existence uh, and you're kind of reaching the end of the path. Uh, but what is interesting is that the four jhanas are spoken of together with the four stages of awakening. They are put basically on the same level. And this is something that we see throughout the suttas, that the jhana states and the awakening states are kind of put on the same level. They are called the footsteps of the Tathagata, they call the superhuman qualities, they call the distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones, they call the meditation at ease, all of these things. Yeah, They are basically on the same level. So when you if you kind of complain, oh, I haven't got the jhanas yet, please don't complain. These things are extraordinary states. And uh, to achieve something like this means that you are knocking on the door of awakening itself. You're getting very, very close if you achieve a jhana state. In fact, uh, uh, you should expect this to be really, really extraordinary. And one of the things that always I find a bit dispiriting is you see people arguing about what the jhanas are on the internet and everywhere else. And they haven't got a clue. And they basically kind of bring them down to some ordinary thing. Oh, I got a bit of pity. They kind of count the jhana factors. I got pity, got sukha, vitaka vichara. I got lots of vitaka vichara. So it must be, that's kind of thinking. I got lots of thinking. So that's kind of sorted out. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and then you have a Kangatai. A Kangatai is kind of the one pointedness of mind. Okay, of course, you're one pointed because you're just seeing this one thing. But you can't really decide whether you have a jhana based on counting the jhana factors. That's way too superficial. Uh, you have to understand much more about the Dhamma to get this right. Uh, it is a particular quality of jhana factors, not just with any vitaka vichara, but a particular kind of vitaka vichara, a particular kind of piti sukha, a particular kind of a kagata. It is not just counting jhana factors. Uh, and what this means, it means that uh, on the path to the jhanas of the deep meditation and samadhi, there's heaps of happiness, heaps of joy, heaps of peace and tranquility to be had long before you get to these jhana states. Uh, and that is kind of the beautiful promise of this path. Yeah? It's like one happiness after the other, one more powerful than the previous one. Uh, and you're all going on and you wonder, where on earth is this leading? This is kind of leading out of this world, isn't it? Uh, well, that's precisely the point. Uh, it is actually leading to the end of the world, the end of the world being the end of the five sense realm. Uh, so it is... Uh, it's kind of extraordinary. And so this is kind of one of those very interesting things about this path. You're just going up and up and up. The 12 first stages of Anapanasati here, one more powerful than the previous one here. So this is um, uh, what we are looking at here, yeah? superhuman qualities, what the Buddha means by this. So four jhanas and four stages of awakening here. Uh, they are called... Uh, superhuman because they are beyond the ordinary human knowledge and understanding and achievement. Uh, and uh, usually the human realm is in the sensory realm and here you have exited the sensory realm. Uh, so they are like beyond the sensory realm. For a while you're no longer human. You're kind of gone beyond humanity in a sense. Uh, so that's why they are called Uttari Manusa Dhamma. Manusa is the Pali word for human. Uh, and then they are also called, and this is the other kind of very interesting word here, uh, um, they are called uh, uh, knowledge and vision, distinction in knowledge and vision, worthy of the noble ones. Alang Arya Nanadasana Visesa is the family for that. Uh, and uh, so worthy of the noble ones, right? Four jhanas and the four uh, stages of awakening, the jhanas are worthy of the noble ones. Uh, so when you get to the jhanas, basically you are you are in the same boat almost as the noble ones, uh, called again called the footsteps of the Tathagata, uh, yeah, distinction in knowledge and vision, uh, and that is really interesting, uh, because what that means is that the four jhanas are a distinction in knowledge and vision. Uh. Normally we think of the jhanas as some state of samadhi where the mind is locked in. Uh, we don't think of the jhanas as knowledge and vision. But here they're called knowledge and vision. This is jnana dasana. This is precisely the word that is used for insight on the Buddhist path. And here it is applied to the jhanas. So be very careful when we talk about samatha and vipassana because actually the jhanas themselves are so full of data about the world, about understanding the world, that when you come out of one of those states, you bring that understanding with you. It's full of knowledge and insight. Yeah? And this is exactly the claim that is being made here. And this is why when you go to the Dhammapada, you see that there as well. It says that the one without jhana has no wisdom, the one, uh, the one without wisdom has no jhana, but the one who has both wisdom and jhana, they are in the presence of Nibbana. You cannot attain a jhana without wisdom. And when you had a jhana, you wouldn't have wisdom following along. These are jnana dasanas. And so sometimes when you hear these kind of claims that, oh, someone obtains deep samadhi, they, are, oh, they don't have got any wisdom, they just have deep samadhi, it betrays a lack of understanding of what is going on. You have tremendous insight when you attain deep samadhi and jhanas. It comes with a territory here because it says something about the world. You can only achieve these things by abandoning heaps of the world. And the way to abandon it is to understand it as dukkha, as impermanent. It's the only way. So insight comes with the idea of samadhi and stillness. So there you are. Anyway, that's what I say. So you can take it or leave it. But... Um, yeah, and then the last one is a meditation at ease. Yeah, meditation at ease is another word for the uh, uh, jhana states. Uh, finally, you can breathe. Wow, how nice to be able to breathe finally. You can really relax. Uh, and this is what these things uh, are about. This is what the Buddha asks these monks. Uh, and what do they reply? They reply the following. Well, sir, while meditating, 
hateful, keen, and diligent, we perceive both light and vision of forms. But before long, the light and the vision of forms vanish. We haven't worked out the reasons for that. Yeah, so a light here, Pali word is obasa, a vision of forms. What well, vision just means like some kind of shape in your mind. You're seeing something in your mind's eye. Yeah, so this is what they see. And of course, what this means really, this is precisely what the nimitta is. Yeah? It is a light, and that light has a particular form. And this is what you see in your meditation. Yeah? So, uh, but then these things vanish. Yeah? And uh, this is exactly the problem that many people have. And some of you here have had really nice meditations, and you've had some of these experiences, at least a little bit of them. So you have an idea, you are basically here on the same par as the super duper monks back in the time of the Buddha, striving to do the same thing, trying to understand what is going on. Isn't that really encouraging? This is Anuruddha, Kimbala and Nandiya. These are the super duper monks of that time. Later on they become Arahants and they are trying to figure out what's going on at this particular point, just like some of you are. Isn't that wonderful? It means that actually this particular sutta, it is for you, yeah? Now we're going to find out what you need to do next uh, to sort out the issues, how to stabilize that nimitta, how to go further, how to reach all these uh, superhuman qualities. Uh, it's kind of nice to know that we are, we are not that different uh, from people at that time. Uh, we have similar problems, similar issues that we need to sort out uh, to move on on this path. Uh, so... We haven't worked out the reason. And then the Buddha says, well, you should work out the reason for that. Uh, and then he goes on, before my awakening, while, while I was still an unawakened, while I was still unawakened, but intent on awakening, I too perceived both lights and visions of forms. Uh, the Buddha to be himself had exactly the same problem. Uh, but before long, my light and vision of forms vanished. Uh, it occurred to me, what is the cause, what is the reason why my light and vision of forms vanish? It occurred to me, doubt has arisen in me, and because of that, my stillness fell away. When stillness falls away, the lightness and vision of forms vanish. I will make sure that doubt will not arise in me again. So this is typical of how the Buddha to be, and the Buddha as well, how he always analyzes things. He asks for the causality behind the phenomena of the world. Why do you lose your samadhi? Why do you lose that ability? Everything is causal. Understand the causal structure and you can do something about it. Everything in Buddhism is like that. Why? Because the world is fundamentally causal. That is the consequence of non-self. If there is a self, there may not be some causality, at least only partially causal, but if there is no self, everything is causal. So you always look for the causes. So this is what he does. And then he says that doubt arose, right? And doubt here in the Buddhism, the word here I think is vichikicca. I haven't really got the part of the text here. Actually, I have it. I can bring it up very, very easily, so maybe I should do that. Uh, yeah, it's Vichikicca, exactly. All that work just to find out it was exactly what I thought it was. Yeah, that's, uh, okay, good. Well, at least we got that confirmed, which is, which is nice. And uh, so what is a doubt in Buddhism, right? And how does that manifest in the mind? And uh, doubt is always defined in the suttas as being uncertain about what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. That is what it means. Yeah? So, for example, when you are meditating and you're kind of doing really well and you, but you, kind of, you stagnate a little bit, let's say the nimitta kind of comes, yeah, and then you don't really know what should I do next. What happens now? Yeah, okay, things are going really well, I feel really blissed out and peaceful. What is blocking me? How, what is the next step on this path? That is kind of doubt, right? And because of that thinking and uncertainty, you're no longer really focusing on the object, and so you lose the object, you lose that light, and you lose the forms as a consequence. So remember, doubt is very specific in Buddhism. It concerns knowing whether something is wholesome and unwholesome, and it does that in two ways. First, it is about your own personal experience. Yeah, what is wholesome in this experience? Are there any unwholesome characteristics here? And secondly, about the suttas, the word of the Buddha. You know what words are wholesome. You know, you know, you know 
when you abandon Vichy Kitsar as one of the characteristics of stream entry, you become a student, you have no doubt anymore because you know which teachings are reliable and which are not. And so this is a kind of doubt, yeah, those two areas. And before you get to a jhana state, before you have entered full samadhi, it can be very hard to navigate the mind, yeah? because the defilements that are left, the problems that are still there, are very subtle and very refined. And sometimes you can't really see it. And sometimes what you have to do, you have to go by confidence in the sutta. So the Buddha says, well, most likely there is some attachment to the body or the five senses. Yeah? Vibhicheva kame, you have to go beyond the five senses. This is the definition of the first jhana. Uh, so, you, okay, let me contemplate that a bit uh, and see if that helps. Uh, this is kind of the advantage of having a teacher. He will tell you, whereas for the Buddha, he has to investigate everything yeah, from scratch pretty much. Uh, and uh, so that is what doubt is about. Uh, and uh, so the Buddha, to be, also had doubt. Yeah? Again, we are in the kind of wind, extremely good company here. Uh, when you find that your meditation is falling away, uh, you are in the highest company possible. Uh, it's kind of nice, isn't it? Uh, and so you know, you can feel really happy that you are heading in the right direction. Uh, you also notice that it's called samadhi here. Yeah? The samadhi falls away. Uh, and in this case, the word samadhi means something prior to the four jhanas. Usually samadhi is a reference to the four jhanas in the suttas, uh, but here it means something else. Uh, and in these cases, samadhi just means that you have we have one object continuously here, but it's not yet the full stillness that comes with the jhana. There may be a little bit of movement, uh, but it's not. Uh, you're basically staying with that object. Uh, that's what it means in this case. Uh. So this is the first of these uh, upakilesas, uh, yeah, that the Buddha is uh, the Buddha to be is experiencing here. Yeah. Let's do one more before we uh, stop. Um, Shell, what time did you want to say something? Is it? Can I go a few more minutes? Yeah, okay, thank you. You're very kind. <laughs> so, um, let's do one more of these defilements. Um, while meditating, dil uh, heedful, keen, and diligent, I perceived both light and visions of forms. Uh, but before lo long, my light and visions of forms vanished. Uh, it occurred to me, what is the cause? What is the reason why my light and vision of forms vanish? Uh, it occurred to me, loss of focus uh, arose in me. Uh, and because of that, my stillness fell away. When the stillness falls away, the light and vision of forms vanish. I'll make sure that neither doubt nor loss of focus will arise in me again. So loss of focus is amanasikara. And of course, manasikara is one of these very fundamental words in the Pali language. We have the idea yoniso manasikara, which means wise attention, or ayoniso manasikara, which means unwise attention. So this means attending to the object. And attention falls away. How does, why does that happen? So attention can fall away for a number of reasons. One thing is that you get distracted by something. At this point, your senses are still not completely gone. You may hear something, right? Uh, you kind of, so your attention goes to that because hearing is a very powerful sense. Uh, and especially if it is a concerning sound, we may kind of be, get distracted. Uh, that is one way that uh, inattention happens. Uh, another way is that the object you start, instead of kind of focusing squarely on the object, uh, you get interested in kind of watching this from different angles and moving your attention around a little bit uh, instead of just staying with the center and the core of that image that you're having here. And that kind of lack of full attention on the core of the image uh, means that some, somehow your samadhi gets lost a little bit and then gradually the mind gets more scattered. Uh, yeah? it kind of, you're not focusing on the center of things. Uh. So the idea here is to keep, simply to keep your attention on this. Uh, and to do that, you just have to keep on seeing the delight, the happiness, the joy, the peace, the beauty of what you're seeing. Uh, at this Point, it is very easy to see the beauty, yeah, it's not very hard because it is extremely powerful. Uh, sometimes it's too powerful, that might lead to inattention maybe. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, it is quite easy at this point. So you stay with the object, uh, you find a good place to meditate where you are likely not to be distracted, uh, and then you can enjoy these wonderful and amazing experiences. Uh, that you had no idea when you got born into this world uh, that these kind of things were possible for human beings. Uh, yeah, and now you feel, wow, the Buddha, thank you, thank you, thank you for showing me this path. Wow, I feel so fortunate. Uh, and this is only the beginning.